Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is Web Page Reproduction, The Washington Post. So in this video, we're going to take a look at how to reproduce a part of The Washington Post. Uh, so what I have here on the left is the entirety of The Washington Post, um, which you can see it's actually quite, quite long. And then the red section down at the bottom, that's actually the section we're going to reproduce. Sadly, they ended up cutting this. So um, I reproduced this last uh, last spring, and it, it's no longer there. But hey, this is part of a professional web page, even though it's no longer with us. Um, so this is going to provide uh, some interesting points, particularly on borders and some subtleties in terms of making your elements look a little bit more interesting that you might not normally think of. Um, and then in addition, it's going to just emphasize as, as I've been doing throughout this idea that you, know, you want to use your cascading style sheet to set up your presentation and that particularly with grid based layout, you can get a lot of flexibility by uh, putting the presentation information in the cascading style sheet and having the semantic information like, what is a heading, uh, you know, what are particular sections uh, semantically, um, you know, like uh, in this particular case, which section is the politics section, which section is the world section, which section is the national section. Uh, by putting that semantic information in the HTML and then pulling the presentation information in the cascading style sheets, you get a lot of flexibility. All right. Um, one thing that you may notice you is that there is this black bar running across uh, the web page. And you can see that in the super miniaturized version up at the top. Uh, and then here I've got a, a view of the top of the web page. And then I have a view of the section that I'm reproducing. That bar there is going to stay there fixed regardless of which section of the web page you're using. I'm not going to talk about that today, but we'll see in another lecture exactly how you can actually set that up. Okay, and so what we have on the left is my reproduction of the section, and then on the right we have the actual web page. And again, I'm using the lorem ipsum that we've seen previously uh, in a number of other lectures, so um, I'm not using their actual headlines, and uh, I'm not using their actual images either. Uh, those are my images on the left. Okay, so here's the HTML, and you can see that uh, basically I've divided things up into sections. Uh, sections A, B, C, D, E, and F. And, uh, you know, those obviously go with the different sections of that are being displayed on the web page. And I'm going in the order in which I'm expecting them to be displayed, but keep in mind that, you know, regardless of the order in which they appear in the HTML and regardless of the names I've given them, I can completely scramble them up. That's no problem. Uh, as long as I'm placing them with grid layout. If I'm using Float or Flexbox, uh, it gets messier. Flexbox, you can actually reorder elements. So, you know, I think you could you could probably put these in different orders with Flexbox. Uh, but with Float, you would pretty much be stuck with the order in which you've created them. And then also, you know, not only can I change the, uh, the placement of the different elements, uh, I can create other types of grids. So here, what I'm showing on the right side is hey, maybe if I had this being displayed on a cell phone, I would want a single column instead of um, three columns and two rows. So, you know, there's a lot of flexibility just by playing around with the grid. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at the actual CSS. So to start off with, um, you can see that uh, if you look carefully in the image on the right, the screenshot on the right, you can see that the actual sections have a white background uh, and that surrounding them is like this light gray background. So I'm going to go ahead and set the body color to uh, F7, F7, F7. So remember, those are hexadecimal digits. Uh, the first F7 is for red. The second F7 is for green. And the third F7 is for blue. And because the amount of red, green, and blue is the same, um, we've got a, a shade of gray. And we're going to see that the entire Washington Post is designed around different shades of gray. So you, you know, anytime you see those pairs repeated, those pairs of hexadecimal digits repeated, that's gray. Different shades, but all gray. And in addition, I've got the font family to set to sans serif. 
Uh, I didn't try and figure out what fonts they were using. I just knew that they were using Sansa or fonts. And again, we'll talk about fonts in another lecture. So ev everything that we're seeing here, uh, this is inside of a div called lower section, um, which represents this bottom section of the Washington Post, which we're trying to reproduce here. And um, you can see that I've said that everything in the lower section is going to be laid out with a grid. And I've had the column set to 1FR, 1FR, 1FR. I'm not setting the rows, which defaults to auto, which means that the rows will increase or decrease in size based on uh, the elements that I've placed inside of them. Okay, so you may recall that FR stands for fractional. And so what 1FR, 1FR, 1FR means is that we've got three columns and the space available from the web browser will be evenly divided among those three columns. So whether we've got a, you know, relatively modestly width uh, web browser window or we have a really wide web browser window, you know, we still got those three columns and uh, things will expand or contract out as necessary. You may notice that also that the, uh, the images on the right are actually wider and taller than the images on the left. And so this is something we're actually going to have to account for. If the images were fixed size, but the columns were able to increase or decrease in width, we'd get some odd effects, uh, and we don't want that to happen. So we do need to get those images to widen out as the uh, the web browser window increases and the FRs uh, increase the space of each of the columns. Okay, so uh, after we've set up the the overall body, um, getting that background color set, we've set everything stand serif. And we set up our columns. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at each of these individual sections. So I have section A, section B, section C, and all the way up to section F. And here are the uh, style uh, properties I'm setting for each of those sections. I'm setting padding and margin. So keep in mind that the padding is a space between the internal elements and that border, and the margin is a space outside of the border. So I need to control both of those. If I don't set any padding, uh, the border is going to be crammed right up against each of the text items there. Um, and if I don't control the margin, all my elements will be right up against each other. And then uh, I've got a number of different colors, as I mentioned. We've already talked about the web page background being that light colored gray. And the sections themselves have a white background. It turns out that there are several other colors that um, the Washington Post is using. And I actually went in with uh, Photoshop uh, with their little eyedropper tool. And so... Uh, I am using their exact colors here. Uh, if you look carefully, you can see that the top left and right of each of these sections is looks a little bit like maybe there's a slight edge or maybe a little 3D look there. And that's because the background color of the section and the background color of the web page is actually different from the background color of the border. So there is a slight difference there. Um, and then if you look really carefully, you can see that the bottom border uh, is actually a little bit thicker. So um, we do need to get those down. And it turns out that bottom border is a slightly different color. Um, we'll take a look at how I set that up a little bit later. And then you'll also notice that there are lines separating each of the individual items. So, well, I guess this is the downside of using lorem ipsum. I have no idea how to pronounce this, but... If you look at the Pretia Magna, and then there's a line underneath it, and then there's the EU Imperial Diet, and then there's a line underneath it, and so on. So that line actually turns out to be a different color as well. Yeah, if you look at all these different colors I've got, we've got the F7, F7, F7. Uh, we've got white, which is, you know, if we actually want to specify that with, uh, with actual hexadecimal numbers, that would be F, 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 F turn all the red, all the green, all the blue to maximum. Um, and then you have EA, 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 D8, 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 D5, D5, D5. And so remember what I said a little bit earlier. Uh, when you see these repeated hexadecimal digits, that means the amount of red, green, and blue is exactly the same. And so what you're really doing is you're not trying to mix the colors. You're actually just increasing or decreasing the intensity. And so these are creating different shades of gray. Okay, so the background color of these uh, sections is white. Um, and then we've got our borders here. So uh, don't forget, we need to set that border style to solid. If you don't set the border style, if you set the border width and the border color, uh, and you don't set a border style, you get nothing. All right, so let's take a close look at these borders. Uh, remember, there's several different ways we can specify the border. Uh, we can 
explicitly say border border width left border width right border width top border width bottom um we can set border width for all of them with a single value we can put two values one for top and bottom one for left and right or we can specify four and you can see that's what we're actually doing here so remember top right bottom left so um, we've got one pixel one pixel and then as i said that if you look at that bottom border it's actually a little bit thicker that's actually two pixels instead of one pixel and then the same thing happens on these colors. So I specify four colors. Uh, the three colors that are the same are the top right and left. And then the bottom is actually um, quite a bit darker. Okay, also, uh, if you look carefully, you'll notice that there's a slight curve on the corner there. This is determined by the border radius. Here I've set three different border radiuses. The first one is no radius at all, and you get that square corner. And then I've used the border radius five pixels, which is what I'm using. And then I have one set to 15 pixels just to kind of emphasize what that border radius does. If you're still not seeing it, here they are highlighted. Look in that lower left-hand corner, and you can see uh, you can see how that all works. Um, and you may also hear be able to hear Maddie uh, drinking from her water dish. She's She's actually been wandering around the living room where, where I'm recording this, kind of looking at me like, let's play. I really want to play. Why are you talking to that? That, you know, why have you been spending all this time working on the computer, getting these graphics right? And now you're talking at that thing. You should be paying attention to me. I'm super cute. All right. Um, and then here I go ahead and place all the elements down in the individual grid elements. This is super straightforward, you know, just hey, that one goes in column one, row one, that one goes in column two, row one, and so on. Very straightforward. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at the individual sections. Uh, there are a few key points here. So you can see this is one of the sections. It has a number of different components. First of all, there's a H3, which is providing the section heading, uh, which in this case is lorem. And I actually don't have an H1 or an H2 here, but my assumption was that certainly you would want an H1 for the main heading on the top of the entire web page, the Washington Post. And it's likely that you know, there might be some other more important headings up top, which you might want to use an H2 for. So I sort of assumed at this point, we're relatively getting into the middle of the heading important. So I went ahead and used H3s for, for these section headings. Um, and you'll notice here down at the bottom left, I say no styling. I actually did not end up doing any styling with the H3, either with the H3s themselves or with this class section heading. It looked right, so I just went ahead and left it. It has the default uh, size, um, default weight, uh, and default mar top and bottom margin. I didn't do anything at all with it. Okay, and then we have the image. So this is an image, uh, this is a photograph of the HMS Victory, which was uh, Admiral Nelson's flagship at the Battle of Trafalgar. And I went ahead and gave us a class. And you'll notice that almost everything I've been doing here in this part is marked as a class. The individual sections have IDs because I want to place those in specific locations. But as far as the images and the headings go and the sections go, those are all marked as classes, not IDs, because they have the same characteristics I'm going to use on all of them. So remember, use ID if you've got a specific item that you want a very specific set of rules for. Uh, in this case, placement on a grid. You know, it seems pretty clear we would not want to place several items on the grid in the same location. That wouldn't make sense. So those use IDs. But everything else uses a class because... Uh, I'm going to use common styling on all the different elements. You can also use type selectors. I, there are a few places I use type selectors. Okay, so in this case, um, I'm giving this image a class, a uh, section image, and um, I'm going to go ahead and set the style, the width style to 100%. And so what this is going to do is, this is going to increase the size of the image width to however much space is available to it by whatever element it's contained within. And the reason why I set the width to 100% is remember, um, we're setting the columns to one FR each. And as the web page widens, the FRs increase in width. And so uh, I want these images to increase or decrease in size depending on uh, how wide the column they're placed within is. And so by setting the image width to 100%. Uh, if that column gets wide, the image gets wide. And um, since I'm not setting a height, 
the height and width will increase proportionally to the proper proportions based on the original image. Okay, and then I've got a number of subsections. Uh, these are divs, and uh, they may include multiple elements. So in this first one, you can see I've got that word up on top, analysis, followed by the actual title there. And so this is actually coming from the original Washington Post. Some of their uh, little topics down here are just marked with the name of the topic, but some of them are marked as analysis, some of them are marked as review, and some of them are marked as perspective. And I use a slightly smaller font, which we'll get to in a minute, uh, and they appear directly above the name of the title. And so I combined all of this into a single div. And so you can see this div contains a secondary div with that analysis word on there. Uh, and then it also has an H4. Um, the next one also has that uh, analysis, uh, the little div on top of it uh, with an H4. And the last one just has the div itself. Um, and so uh, you can see what I've done here is the entire div, the outer div, the subsection title div, which includes analysis as well as the title of the article, um, that has a 10 pixel margin and 10 pixel padding. And so that 10 pixel margin and padding encloses both the word analysis as well as whatever's underneath it. So this is not 10 pixels between analysis and what uh, and pretium magna. It's 10 pixels outside of analysis and pretium. All right, so you'll notice that um, there are lines between each of the elements here. And so uh, I need to write a rule that's going to take care of that. And so I've gone ahead and done that by setting the border bottom to one pixel solid and then that D5, D5, D5. Again, that's a, that's a shade of gray. Um, now, I only want them to go below the first two elements. I don't want it to go below the last element. Uh, and so the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to override the behavior on the last element by using this pseudo class last child. And so because that last element, uh, the ut ante metis is the last subsection title, um, it's the last child of its parent, um, I'm going to override the border bottom and set it to zero pixel. So all of the elements are going to have a bottom border except for the last child um, that will not have a bottom border. And so that's how I'm going to go ahead and create the lines between each of the elements, but not below the last element. Okay, and then finally, here's how I actually set the, uh, uh, the f font size and weight for uh, each of the uh, analysis as well as the uh, the wording below the word analysis. And um, this one uses analysis in, in both the first two elements. There are other places where I use different, I use the perspective and the review just as the original Washington Post does, just not in this particular example here. And so you can see I set the uh, H4, which uh, is the main text for each of these subsection titles. Um, I set it to margin zero, padding zero, and font size 12 points. So this is actually worth mentioning. Um, so a lot of the different elements on the web page do have preset margin, particularly top and bottom margin. All the headings have preset top and bottom margin. And uh, you may want to get rid of that. And so that's what I'm doing here. I'm explicitly saying, yeah, I know that there's a margin already set for the H4s, but let's not use that margin. I want to get rid of that margin. This is semantically an H4, so I want to leave it marked as an H4, but I want to override the, uh, the box behavior, uh, which includes some margin padding and border. There's no preset border, but I do want to get rid of the margin and padding. I'm going to go ahead and set to zero pixels particularly because I want that word analysis to be right up against it, uh, just as it is in the Washington Post example. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that. I'm going to set the font size to 12 point, and it turns out the default behavior on the H4 is going to go ahead and set it to bold. Um, so uh, I get the look that I'm looking for. And then the subsection type, that's the analysis or perspective or review, um, that's just a div, and so I do need to provide uh, whatever styling I want on it. And so I'm going to go ahead and set the font size to nine point, and I'm going to set the font weight to bold. So that's our little reproduction of the bottom section of the Washington Post. Um, 
you know, again, uh, hopefully the main, the number one takeaway I want you guys to get from this is, hey, I can do this. Like this is a professional web page. I can make a web page that looks every bit as good as this professional web page does. You know, and with the techniques we've shown you, it's really not that hard. It's going to take you some time to do the analysis. It's going to take you some time to do some tweaking to get the sizes right, the spacings the way you want. Uh, but you could definitely reproduce these things. Um, and assuming you have the artistic skills, which I don't necessarily have, but if you have the artistic and graphic design skills, you know, you can go ahead and come up with one of these on your own and you can go ahead and turn your vision into reality using the cascading style sheets we've been teaching you. All right, I'll talk to you guys soon.